Hello, this is the American Medical Association's COVID-19 update. Today, we're talking with Dr. Carol Rao, an epidemiologist for the CDC's COVID-19 emergency response in Atlanta, about the mental health impact the COVID-19 pandemic has had on the public health workforce. I'm Todd Unger, AMA's Chief Experience Officer in Chicago. Dr. Rao, thanks for joining us today. Uh, you were the lead on a CDC study that looked at the pandemic's impact on mental health within the public health workforce. And I'd love just to start by defining for our audience out there what you mean by the public health workforce. So the public health workforce that we're talking about are these frontline workers. So these are people with boots on the ground. So uh, these are the public health workers at your state, territorial, tribal, and local health departments. So these are the people that would be the ones that count and tabulate the number of COVID-19 cases in your communities, develop guidance and prevention strategies for your communities, investigate clusters of, uh, clusters of cases, and um, implement uh, an unprecedented vaccination campaign for this uh, for this pandemic. So, you know, it's interesting because we've talked a lot about uh, the healthcare workforce and the impact on mental health that the COVID-19 pandemic has had, but I think there's a lot less information about the impact on uh, public health workers. Is that is that right? So I would say that public health workers in, in this time frame or uh, previous to this time frame, previous to we're not really considered frontline healthcare workers or frontline workers or essential workers. They're, I'm a public health worker and we generally kind of work in the background. So there's not been that much done and um, looked at as far as uh, incidents of mental health conditions or stress among this population. And that's surprising because I, I imagine that they're experiencing you know, the same level of, uh, you know, trauma to some extent that uh, healthcare workers are. Is that not accurate? Well, that's, that's what we had assumed, or that's what we had thought, which is why we embarked upon this survey, because there hasn't been any work done previously on this, on this population. But because of the unprecedented, prolonged uh, response to this particular outbreak or um, pandemic, we felt like that this, that that there was time to, 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 to look at this population because it hadn't been done in the past. And we thought that their, um, that, uh, their stressors and trauma would be similar to what's been experienced by healthcare workers. So uh, you've kind of answered the question as to why you undertook the study. Can you just give some basics around you know, when and how this took place? Sure. Uh, we did a, uh, a non-probability-based online survey that was anonymous that was sent out to public health workers across the United States. So that we did this between uh, late March and the, the survey was open for three weeks between March and April. And 26,000 healthcare workers, 26,000 public health workers participated in this, um, in this survey. That's about 10% of the population of this workforce population in the United States. So big base size. Uh, uh, a lot of people responding to this. Uh, you know, we know why you undertook this study. Uh, what did you find? So we found that 53% of the people who responded reported symptoms of a mental health condition. So when we break that down by mental health condition, 30% reported uh, symptoms of depression, 32% reported symptoms of anxiety, and 37% reported symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. And in addition, 8% reported suicidal thoughts. And when we looked at the prevalences, the highest prevalences were among people who uh, were under the age of 30, who were, who identified as uh, transgendered or non-binary, or who identified as multiple races. So that's enormous. So more than one out of two uh, folks in your uh, in your survey then responding that you know at least one medical condition, huge incidences of depression, PTSD. Were you surprised by this? So um, the rates of of depression and anxiety were very similar to what's been previously reported among uh, the general population and the healthcare and the, uh, and healthcare workers. But what we were surprised at was PTSD. So the prevalence of PTSD um, was about 10 to 20 percent higher among these public health workers than when compared to the general population and to frontline and essential healthcare workers. You mentioned though there a much higher prevalence among you know, younger respondents and transgender and non-binary people of all ages. Any clue as to why? Are you still looking at that data? So to tell you the truth, those, when we look at just the demographics, that actually is very similar to what's been found in the general population for those demographics. 
So we really think that for this particular group, that it's a lot uh, much more to do with their workplace factors than their demographic factors. When you look at them, so you're basically saying what we're seeing among the public health workforce, similar levels uh, of, of this kind of trauma. Are the sources of that pretty, pretty much the same as we would say at the healthcare worker at large, or are there other kind of specific drivers um, that rose to the top? What I would say is that the, um, the prevalence of symptoms of depression and anxiety were similar to what's been previously reported in the general population and healthcare workers. But the prevalence of PTSD was the one that was pretty significant for us because that was higher. That was 10 to 20% higher than what's been previously reported among general population and frontline and uh, essential healthcare workers. And do you see the drivers of that? Uh, similarities, differences, you know, what is, what's behind it? So when, when, we add, when, when we look at workplace factors, about 90% of the people who responded said that they worked directly on COVID-19 activities, with 60% of them reporting working over 40 hours a week, on average, since March 2020. And that's a pretty long time. And the severity of symptoms of, ad, ad, of each adverse mental health condition increased with increasing time spent at work, so over, over 40 hours, and also the proportion of time that they spent of their day working on COVID-19. So the longer hours they worked, over 40 hours, and the more time that they spent or the more proportion of time that they spent working on COVID-19 increased, was, was um, matched with increasing uh, severity of symptoms of, um, of a mental health condition. We asked about traumatic events and stressors experienced since March 2020 at the start of the pandemic, both personal and job related. And what we found was that 12% reported receiving job related threats because of their work, and that a quarter was reported feeling bullied, threatened, or harassed because of their work. A quarter also experienced stigma and discrimination because of their work. And I think that these numbers are very unusual for any work population, and that should be addressed. So Working on COVID-19 is really taking a toll on this workforce. Um, you know, when you think about um, uh, burnout and mental health uh, issues coming out of this, uh, we see among the, you know, healthcare workers, you know, we talked a lot about physicians in this problem, kind of not, uh, you know, wanting to seek help or talk about this uh, as a problem. Is that something you also see in the public health workforce? So we don't know much about, uh, about burnout uh, among this population before the pandemic. But when speaking to burnout during the pandemic, I can, we, we found that public health workers who were unable to take time off uh, when needed were nearly twice as likely to report symptoms of a mental health condition. And among those who were not able to take time off, the most commonly reported reasons were because um, there was no coverage at work, uh, they were worried about falling behind on their work. And more than 50% said that uh, they felt guilty about taking time off from work. Mm. And about 18% said that their employer did not allow them to take time off from work because there was so much to do. So say, taking time off from work wasn't necessarily just a, um, uh, a management issue, but it's like it was a person, it was that this particular workforce's personal uh, reasons of not wanting to leave behind their work. I would say, not being able to take time off is a problem for almost anyone. And yeah. uh, those people are not dealing with COVID-19 patients or uh, really the, you know, the potential toll of loss of lives. That's, uh, that's very heavy. Um, you know, when you think about you know, what you now know and you think about the longer term implications uh, for public health um, due to the pandemic and kind of beyond, you know, what kind of implications do you see? So we know from the literature that increases in, uh, in mental health symptoms among workers have been linked to increased absenteeism, high turnover, low productivity, and low morale, which could influence the effectiveness of public health organizations during emergencies. So these results have implications regarding not only these, uh, the workforce's health, uh, which is critical, but also how their health might affect the, the ability of the, uh, of the public health organization to respond. So this is, so public so mental health of public health workers is, is, um, is a critical issue for emergency response. And is there anything uh, coming out of the study or anything you've learned about ways that we can lessen the burden on our public health workforce? So one of the ways that, uh, that um, 
to address mental health in the workplace is NIOSH, NIOSH, which is the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, recommends a hierarchy of controls when it comes to managing, uh, managing workplace stress or managing mental health. And it focuses mostly on the work processes and tasks. So it's to eliminate, reduce, and manage in that order. And we know that, um, that uh, from literature, job strain is highly related to psychological stress of workload and low decision, low control over decision-making process. And I think these are things that probably are out of the out of control of a, of a public health worker during a time of a, of a pandemic. But there are strategies we could use to reduce adverse mental health symptoms among public health workers in emergency responses. For example, expanding staffing size, implementing flexible work schedules, to reduce the need for long work hours, and then to encourage workers to take regular breaks. In addition, our employee assistance, program, employee assistance programs uh, could be evaluated and to become be more accessible to, uh, to these workers. And in particular, to destigmatize the request for mental health assistance. Um, what we found was that 20% of, uh, of respondents said that they needed mental health services but did not get it. I'd like to emphasize that prevention should not focus solely upon the individual, but rather on its systems and processes. Telling people that they should take a break, sending emails that the EAP is available, still puts the burden on the individual. So as this survey shows, that this is a very dedicated work, a workforce population where many felt guilty about taking leave. So, um, so in addition to workplace support, I would encourage that public health workers be regarded as essential and frontline workers that, that they are, and that, they're, um, that they are assisted by their communities and by their healthcare providers. Big uh, recognition to all those public health care workers out there uh, on the front lines. Uh, you know, uh, public health, obviously not something that we can take for granted. Uh, and the work that uh, uh, this force uh, puts in to take care of folks out there. Uh, is greatly appreciated and uh, obviously up against a lot. So thank you so much for the important work uh, that you and your team have done uh, to help quantify uh, the toll that this has taken and hopefully we'll learn for that uh, so we can have a better future out there. Uh, Dr. Rao, thanks for joining us today. That's it for today's COVID-19 update. For resources on COVID-19, visit ama-assn.org slash COVID-19. Thanks for joining us. Please take care.